And so we go to this small room and Bill walks in and I've never felt a human presence like that. Bill was an enormous presence. Uh, it would be in any room, but this was a small room. And I kind of felt like an insignificant human being. <laughs> and he basically said, so you're daring me to come out of retirement. The project with Bill came about through uh, a really kind of a surprise meeting with him and Tommy Kriegsman, the um, artistic director of New York Live Arts. He had engaged Y Music to do a residency there of uh, seven concerts, and I had just offhandedly mentioned that we would love to do something with Bill. The kernel of that idea was uh, you know, really stemmed from my long-held desire to work with Y Music. To develop a uh, process for them that, that was going to leave a different kind of mark, a signature work that would be something of a landmark slash pivotal moment in, you know, Y Music's history. He said, so Bill T. Jones would like to meet with you. And we were like, and I looked at Rob, I was like, why is that? And he said, well, I kind of offhandedly said, you know, of course we'd love to collaborate with Bill T in this residency. And then they continued talking about other ideas because, you know, he hasn't danced in nine years, I think, at that point. What better resource than to have the, you know, remarkable mind and body of a Bill T. Jones and that artistry and that decades-long history and how to wed the generations to actually get two... Um, uh, bodies of artists together, you know, the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company and the history of Bill T. with the, the, the history and dramaturgy really behind Y Music's evolution. You know, where could those two meet in a place that would be pivotal for both artists? I don't know that I thought it was going to go anywhere, but when we showed up for our meeting, Bill was actually interested in talking with us and um, kind of almost took it as a challenge to come out of retirement to work with us. You haven't danced in nine years. We weren't a group nine years ago. Like, what, what, what is that, you know, experience? And, and at the end of the, and he said, so what do you want to do with me? And Rob just sort of said, we want you to collaborate with our friend Marcos Palter. The person who first contacted me was Rob, and he said that Beauty Jones will be interested in, you know, doing some, some sort of a collaborative project, and uh, they asked me if I would be interested, and I was like, duh, of course, it's Beauty Jones, of course I am. When I met Marcos, um, he was introduced to me as Brazilian, and at that time I was thinking a lot about what the uh, people who work in the contemporary avant-garde progressive art world uh, most people are not um, people of color. Bill and I talked about the idea of being a minority in a field that is not really, you know, a field that one would associate minorities being part of or a representative part of. Um, Bill in dance, of course, and me in, you know, classical music, whatever that may mean. I was trying to find a way to get basic with him. Let's talk as two people who are not white people. Let's talk about, let, let's put aside our artistic identities and let's talk about where are you from? We talked a lot about where we came from, um, who we were, and uh, how our, our stories were confusing. You know, I mean, 
I'm from Brazil, but I, you know, have lived in the U.S. for you know my entire adult life. You're from the New World. You were the result of colonization and all that stuff. I want to just take his temperature. He was not from New York originally, um, so the the whole discussion was, you know, about what is home. I mean, I didn't know what to expect. I had never talked to him before. Um, so I went in with, you know, zero expectations. We had zero plans, you know, we were just gonna sort of brainstorm. And I said, well, what's this piece gonna be about? And he said, well, what are you, what, 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 what are you thinking? And then we began to, I was saying it should be about uh, roots, it should be about home. And I thought that we were gonna meet for 15 minutes and it ended up being this two and a half hour, you know, very cathartic conversation that went everywhere. And by the end of it, we kind of had an idea of what the piece could potentially be about. My one regret is that I didn't record their conversation because it was, it was profound and wide ranging and beautiful, but, um, you know, needless to say, it really worked well. Diane McAdar came into the picture um, through a desire to work with a iconic female um, uh, dance force. There was a particular desire to meet this um, theme that we kept revolving around this idea of home. Um, that came up in one of the uh, early conceptual meetings with Bill. I got a call from Tommy Kriegsman, and I had just met Tommy just over the phone like that. And he told me about this project that sounded amazing with um, Y Music and with music by Marcos Balter. So I had to research both the music and Marcos, and that Bill T. Jones would be dancing on two nights and if I was interested, I would be dancing on the other two nights to the exact same music. So that's when I first heard about it. It sounded intriguing. Diane McIntyre is not from this world. She is like a special angel person. And I think we all felt when we, when we rehearsed with her for the first time um, that, that we were um, really blessed to be in her presence. She just sort of didn't seem like she walked on the ground, it seemed like she floated. She like walked into the room and she was, you know, very like light and like sort of like a butterfly. It's very rare where two choreographers will even be connected in any way, in any way at all. Once in a while they may, somebody may have a bright idea that two choreographers work on the same piece. And uh, however, even that is rare. So that was quite unique, uh, quite a unique idea for New York Live Arts. Marcos had an idea that he would talk to me, he would talk to Bill, he would have his own idea, and then, then those ideas would merge together to help develop his composition. He actually didn't have an idea that Bill and I would communicate. That was intentional, so that we actually, in a way, would not be influenced choreographically by each other. He wanted to be totally unique to each of us as choreographers. When we had our initial conversations, they were not that different. Um, when I talked to Bill and when I talked to Diane and, you know, when we decided that we were going to frame the, 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 the piece around the concept of home, it was really interesting how these three very different experiences of these three black artists from different nationalities, or in my case and their case, but, you know, with completely different histories, you know, and even understanding of what being black is. Uh, sort of came together quite beautifully. He identifies himself as a black individual. And for him, that home 
had many different layers. You know, I, 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 I feel very connected to where I come from. I feel very connected to Brazil, to Rio de Janeiro. Um, but I also feel very connected to the places that I've lived since I've left Brazil. Um, I feel very connected to Chicago, where I spent 12 years that were very important to me. And uh, now that I'm in New York, I feel very connected to the city as well. I spoke about my background growing up in Cleveland, about my family, and I said that I had lived in New York for 30 years, so I was confused about <laughs> whether my home was really the Cleveland environment or the New York City environment, where I had developed all of my work as a choreographer, as an artist. And at the same time, I think I ended my conversation where I felt that home was actually inside, like in the heart. And that wherever you are, that home is there within you. So the, the, the initial conversations were very harmonious. And then, you know, I, I went on to write the music. I gave them the music and they did their works, you know, separately. And it was quite beautiful really to see the two, the two works coming back and being really night and day, completely different. I mean, Diane being all about the spirituality, the, 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 the magical, almost like mystical side of the piece, and Bill being about, you know, the visceral part, the, the, the violence, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, brutal, the brutality behind the idea of the concept. So it was, it, was, it was quite nice. Out came these two extraordinary and vastly different works of art uh, that these two um, remarkable artists interpreted in such different ways, in such different but, but deeply, deeply powerful ways. One. My company had just been in Paris performing a work called Letter to My Nephew, which was a distant reference to James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. It was very successful. People were excited. They, and the next night was going to be the next performance, and that very night was the Bataclan attack from the terrorists. France shut down. The piece was done once. We were supposed to perform the next day, but the theater was closed, so what do you do? We go into tourist mode, but all the tourist places were closed, and the place was in mourning. So we go to an ethno ethno ethnological museum uh, and uh, walking around there in a daze because there's nobody there and seeing these figurines, a uh, Han figure, Tang figure, um, all very beautifully put together. And I began taking pictures of them, uh, these shapes. I wanted something that was grounded in history and grounded in unquestioned aesthetics. So Tang movement, uh, I got my eye on you. So a, a movement which looks like this, some young dancers doing this in a thousand years ago, what have you, and I gave it titles. All of them, I sort of made, I tried to make the titles as contemporary or associative as I could. And then they were going to be fit into this score, moving different ways, and then maybe saying the names, maybe not. That's what the structure was. And then the, sh the shooting in Chicago had happened. Uh, Laquan, I think his name was. This is the one, uh, and there's been so many. Young guy walking down the street, I, and uh, he is, seems to me, minding his own business. And there's a traffic stop, and something happens. The police said he was waving a knife or a gun, and you see him shot, boom, and he turns like it looks like a marionette. You don't often really see people shot. And it's so far away, all you see is the uncanny feeling of a person walking, and then they turn like a dancer and collapse. And that 
uh, was uh, uh, something was in that. When I saw Bill's work for the first time, I was very surprised, but I could understand why Bill saw the piece the way that he did. In my case, it was very much connected to my ancestors in Brazil. Um, the idea of, um, of uh, slavery, you know, uh, 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 as being sort of a confinement that can be seen as home or a forced home and uh, the idea of not belonging to where you are, um, which, you know, I also sort of connected to my own story. And then when I saw Bill sort of recontextualizing that and really talking very overtly about African-American struggles in the U.S., um, especially, you know, like issues surrounding, you know, police violence and unjust incarceration, I, I saw, I understood it. You know, it was still about oppression. It was still about persecution of minorities. It was still about uh, feeling constrained. So even though it wasn't my initial dream, I could see how that was, you know, something that came from the same place. There's your music and that beautiful sound that was coming out of your throats. And then there's my body. What's left of my dancing? I've retired from dancing. I told uh, Marcos and CJ, and uh, I am struggling with the structure of it, but I know I'm not struggling with what I'm feeling. And then there's the actuality of my body in that ridiculous orange, the re actuality of my white hair and my uh, aging body and what I was saying. I got my eye on you. Mmm. Come dance the jerk. Mmm. Hold it. Hold it. All gestures, all labels are equal. Eventually, the music came to me in the computerized form, and I started developing some themes. Then we had the opportunity to actually be with Marcos and all the musicians of Y Music at a rehearsal. I think it was just maybe a week or so before the performance. I went to the restroom to change my clothes. When I was coming out of the restroom, I heard someone singing. I said, whoa, that is, they're haunting. It's really um, beautiful. I said, I wonder what that's from. And then when I came into the studio, Marcos told me that that is the chant at the beginning of the composition. I said, what? I said, I didn't hear any chant at the beginning of the composition. He said, oh, in the computerized version, it doesn't really sound like a voice. He said, I tried to make it sound like a voice. I said, well, what is it? He said, it has a ritualistic sound. He said, yes, it's from my tradition. It's an Orisha, it's Oshala. That is a prayer to Oshala. And he spoke to me a little bit about what that meaning was. And it was so pure and so, it had a divine sound. Uh, so right then and there, I was going to be changing my whole concept. The whole piece is based on this chant, this Yoruba chant um, in Yoruba itself that talks about you know, a father or my father, which can be seen as a literal father or you know, some higher being, uh, either coming into one's home 
or you going towards you know your father's home um, and uh, so I wanted to create this sense of ascension you know this this a uh, gradual ascension this 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 long trance you know that that sort of uh, transported one you know towards whatever home may be for him this composition is an offering related to his own tradition, his own faith that he came up in. And so uh, we started with the musicians and the opening I felt should be something like a uh, opening of a ritual. Like you are opening the space and you are giving thanks to all the deities and to the ancestors. And uh, somehow the opening part, I just did some things that felt like that. When I saw Diane's choreography, I, I freaked out because she didn't know about the, 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 the text, where the text was coming from. Um, she didn't know anything you know, about my my hiding of this uh, Yoruba chant. The chant itself is a chant for uh, Oshala, um, who is one of the main deities of uh, Candomblé in Brazil. Um, and Oshala's colors are white and blue. And, um, you know, Oshala's gestures are very sort of grandiose. And when I saw Diane dancing, and when, you know, I saw her dressed in white, and the gestures that she was doing, you know, around the musicians, I mean, she looked like she was, you know, sort of receiving that spirit. And, you know, and the dance itself really looked like what you would see in an Umbanda or Candomblé um, uh, ritual. And, uh, and she did it all intuitively. So it, it, it really freaked me out. I mean, it was beautiful, but it was really spooky. He mentioned to me that there were some things that I had done movement-wise that actually the people do in the rituals to Oshala. I said, oh, whoa. He said, and you did a particular move where you put this foot back and you bent over like that. He said, in depictions of Oshala, he is in that position. I'm like, oh, wow. So everything had a magic for me. So the title of the piece is We Carry Our Homes Within Us, Which Enables Us to Fly, which is a quote uh, by John Cage. Um, and uh, the first time I heard that quote, it so connected with me. I was like, ah, yes, someone is actually talking about home or where one comes from or where one belongs in a way that I can understand, you know, because I'm, I'm looking at my own trajectory, of, you know, jumping from one place to another and you know being away from my home country for most of my life and, and, and trying to understand what is home and where is home and you know and, and then coming to that final realization that I am home, that I don't need to find a space to belong, you know, that the space that I belong to is myself as a person. He emailed me the title and the title was only half of the title. This is part of my journey. The title was, we, we carry our home within us. That was it. That was what I had as the title. On the day when we had our first rehearsal, um, Marcos told me the entire title of the piece. We carry our homes within us which enables us to fly. So when I heard the part which enables us to fly, I didn't know that while I was working on my compositions, while I was working on my uh, themes. So then I knew that, the, that this piece is a journey, and through the journey, 
We fly. That's what the journey is all about. My efforts throughout the piece was so that I could soar, so that the, I could soar with the music. The thing about you guys in your wine music, I think you still believe in beauty. Art, music is going to be one of the ways we fight back the darkness of this moment. This is my fifth prayer today. So, maybe all you have to do is do more, enable us to fly. Going down, Captain. Maybe you just have to play heartbreakingly beautiful and fierce and intelligent. All right, wine music, throw down. Working with you on that music gave me an opportunity to think about my body, to think about what it means for me to be um, on stage performing again with um, bad D, with <laughs> uh, white hair. And it encouraged me to be generous and fierce. Generous, fierce, brave. You too.